Good morning, and welcome to the 30th Annual Randolph W. Thoreau Symposium. My name is Rachel Mondel, and I am the Editor-in-Chief of the Emory Law Journal. This year's symposium is centered around the topic of judicial politics. As the recent Supreme Court decision, Citizens United, and the uh, various lower court decisions on the health care law demonstrate, politics and judges often collide, both at the federal, state, and local levels. The panelists today will be exploring different aspects of judicial politics. It is my hope that you'll not only find their discussions thought-provoking and enlightening, but also I hope that it will open up broader debate among you on the merits of this collision. This is, as I mentioned, the 30th Annual Thoreau Symposium. I would like to especially thank the Thoreau family for their generous support over the years and allowing the journal to put on this symposium. We could not do it without your generous support. In addition, I would like to thank the journal's executive symposium editor, Eric Meir, for his diligent hard work throughout the year in putting this symposium together. Um, the symposium editor, Eugene Cornell, and the 2L class of the journal have also been instrumental in helping us make today run so smoothly. Uh, the staff and faculty of Emory Law School, particularly professors William Busby, uh, Joanna Shepard Bailey, Professor Michael Kang, and Professor Bobby Audier are integral to the symposium's success. On behalf of the journal, please accept our thanks. Last, but certainly not least, I would like to thank Dean Partlett for his help and support throughout the entire year in helping Eric and me put together this, this symposium. Thank you all so much for coming. I hope you really enjoy this, today's symposium. At this time, please join me in welcoming the Dean of Emory Law School, David Partlett. Professor Freed and I are a little taller, so uh, there's a low-tech solution to, to getting this uh, higher. Well, it's a treat to welcome everyone here this morning, and uh, as uh, Rachel said, um, this is the 30th uh, Thrower Symposium. The Thrower family has supported the symposium throughout this uh, 30 years. Uh, Randolph Thrower uh, used to attend this faithfully. He can't this year, but uh, I know he's here in spirit. Uh, we've got uh, two of the uh, Thrower family here, uh, Wilson Barmeyer and uh, Laura Thrower Harris here with us, so uh, welcome. Uh, Rachel was quite incorrect. I played very little part, of course, in, in, in this whole thing. Uh, but uh, this is very much a uh, student-driven uh, event. Uh, it's, it, it's at the apex of the uh, academic life of the uh, Emory Law School. And uh, as in many things in this law school, it is the students who drive it. And so I'm very grateful to all of the Law Review and, in fact, to all of the students here at uh, the Law School who make uh, the life of the faculty so worthwhile. The uh, symposium throughout the 30 years uh, has been hosted by the Emory Law Journal. And it does seem that the uh, journal uh, staff and the organizing committee every year comes up with a topic that is timely, important, fixating, uh, and uh, certainly uh, the product of which uh, in the scholarship that appears in the journal uh, is landmark uh, scholarship. It ranges, last year we had uh, the issue of regulation and deregulation. We've had uh, interactive federalism. Uh, prior to that, we had families in the uh, 21st uh, century, genetics, immigration. So the topics range widely, uh, but uh, always, always very important. And that's certainly not an exception uh, in the topic that uh, we are focusing upon today. 
The issues surrounding judges and uh, politics have never been more in the public eye. We've debated this for a long time. We've, we've seen this, it comes up in the press, but uh, now is an era in which uh, we're having a much closer look at this in a scholarly way, it seems to me. Uh, and it's not only legal scholars who are doing this examination, it is political scientists, it is economists, and so this, this gives uh, rise to an interesting debate uh, between legal scholars, uh, political scientists, and economists in how to prize apart this, uh, this whole issue of the, of the interrelationship of judges and uh, politics. But it does seem that the comfortable assumptions that we used to have about judicial independence, assumptions that supported our ideas of constitutional competence and Republican government are a little less safe now than they used to be. So there's a gimlet eye on judges, and I think today's proceedings will rather concentrate uh, that, uh, that gaze. It's interesting that this issue is very American. Just uh, a few weeks ago, uh, we had visit the uh, law school, um, the Chief Justice of the High Court of Australia, uh, Bob French. And um, uh, it's interesting in uh, talking with uh, Chief Justice French uh, about this whole uh, connection of uh, politics and uh, the uh, judiciary. Uh, and he was rather befuddled by it. I mean, it's not something, even though the Australian High Court is one that looks at a constitution that necessarily involves public policy, that is based very much upon the American Constitution, stripped of the Bill of Rights, but nevertheless looking at uh, very basic political issues. Um, it's a, uh, this characterization of uh, judges as political actors seem quite foreign to uh, Chief Justice French. And it's quite foreign, I think, to, uh, to, to most uh, jurists as they come to the United States or as they read about uh, American uh, judges. And that's not to say these people are naive, they're very sophisticated. Uh, it's, in fact, in many ways, I think, if you look at uh, judges in the uh, rest of the um, Western industrialized world, in the uh, UK, Canada, and uh, Australia, New Zealand, for example, you find that those judges, in fact, involve themselves in, in the uh, legal academy more than most of our judges do but it does seem strange to them, passing strange to them, that there's this close connection between politics and, uh, and judges. So this is a very important topic, and I congratulate uh, the Emory Law Journal and the members of the uh, planning committee for bringing it to us, and particularly in bringing some of the best from all around the nation to, uh, to be with us uh, this morning. I uh, wish to thank also the uh, members of the Emory Law Journal staff who have put this together, Eric Meir, uh, Eugene Corn uh, Cornell, and uh, of course, Rachel Mondel. My colleagues on the faculty played a uh, very important role uh, Bobby Adia, Bill Busby, Michael Kang, Joanna Bailey, and Charlie Shana uh, led the way. They worked uh, hard, and we should never forget the uh, tireless work of the staff who makes it all possible that we can gather and discuss important topics. There are many to, to thank, but I want to single out uh, Keith uh, Miller, Veronica Wright, and Corky Gallo um, uh, this morning and to, to thank them. We're, we're very privileged uh, to have uh, with us this morning as the keynote speaker, Charles Fried. 
Uh, Charles Freed, as you know, has had a very distinguished uh, career. Uh, we've got a, a little potted history of uh, Professor uh, Freed's uh, uh, glittering career in the, in the pamphlet, uh, but it's, it's remarkable, ranging from uh, his days as Solicitor General to his uh, days on the uh, Massachusetts court uh, to uh, his uh, distinguished career as one of the great uh, academics uh, in the country, in the world, uh, on the Harvard uh, faculty. Last night we were talking about uh, our dear uh, departed uh, uh, faculty colleague uh, Harold Berman and of course uh, Charles Freed and Harold Berman were together on the Harvard faculty for many decades and uh, got to know one, uh, one another very well. So it's, it's a great privilege to uh, invite uh, Professor Freed uh, to the podium this morning. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's fine. When the editors of the Emory Law Review invited me to open this symposium on judging, they proposed that I reflect on the present Chief Justice's widely debated statement of his conception of judging. John Roberts has been both praised and scorned for the metaphor he presented to the Senate Judiciary Committee at the hearing on his confirmation to be Chief Justice of the United States. It's my job to call balls and strikes. It was an arresting use of language because unlike so many metaphors that litter the discourse in and about the law, think of sweeps too broadly or paints with a broad brush. It is not so time-worn that, as George Orwell has noted, the original meaning has drained out of it and we are left only with a cliché, a ponderous way of saying something that could be said more directly. No, here we catch a flash of a picture, a catcher, and standing behind him, the distinctively shirted official and the ball hurtling towards the batter's head or far off, wide of the mark. Another cliche, by the way. And just because the phrase is alive with resonance, it provokes rather than deadens thought. Fans applauded because Chief Justice Roberts' metaphor signaled a restrained, modest, almost anonymous role for the judge. Critics balked because the metaphor suggests that there is always, at least in principle, an objectively correct call. The umpire offering only a necessarily imperfect human approximation of what an, elect what an accurate electronic monitor could settle beyond possibility of dispute, as is done in determining the order of finish in a horse race, a photo finish. This conception would make the human element, the element of judgment, not a virtue, but a regrettable second best. As so often happens, the commentary reached a pitch in either direction only because commentators did not bother to read the whole statement, bowdlerizing from the accounts of others who also had not read the whole. Here I supply some context. Judges and justices are servants of the law, not the other way around. Judges are like umpires. Umpires don't make the rules, they apply them. The role of an umpire and a judge is critical. They make sure everybody plays by the rules. But it is a limited role. Nobody ever went to a ball game to see the umpire. I have no agenda, but I do have a commitment. Uh, I will remember that it's my job to call balls and strikes and not to pitch or bat. Here we catch the wider residence, and it offers much to think rather than scream about. First, there is the dominant point. The judge's role, while important, is subordinate. He enforces rules. He does not make them. 
That is the first and critical antithesis. In rhetoric, this technique is called aloiosis. Related to Robert's dominant point, though not quite the same, is the last antithesis, to call balls and strikes and not to pitch or bat. Here, Roberts calls attention to the difference, not between judges and legislators, rule pliers and rule makers, but between a player and the umpire who enforces the rules on the player. Only the former can be said to win or lose. This connects to Robert's most striking and substantive com commitment. I come before the committee with no agenda. I have no platform. This in contrast to those who do make the rules and are contestants. Judges are not politicians. Finally, and most fetchingly, is a phrase that represents the very epitome of judicial modesty. Nobody ever went to a ball game to see the umpire. As I have said, every live metaphor provokes thought. To begin my reflection, I mention both what is right and what is wrong about this one. Rule maker, not rule applier. Even putting aside the common law, this is truer when the court applies a statute or regulation than it is in constitutional cases. But even in the former, the strike zone analogy is only partially apt. Consider the long-running dispute between Justices Scalia and Breyer on statutory interpretation. Scalia insists that the court goes astray when it moves beyond the strike zone of the words of the statute itself. Breyer insists that the court does its job of making our democracy work, drawing on the title of his latest book, by collaborating with the legislature in implementing the purposes it had in mind, which often means going well beyond the words in which the legislature embodied those purposes to consider the legislative history and even the subsequent legislative history of the statute. I don't want to get into the, who is right or wrong about this. Rather, I point out that both justices claim to be calling balls and strikes according to the statute. So there must be a further game, a meta game, as it were. It reminds me of the wonderful uh, song by Tom Lehrer, anything you can do, I can do meta. I can do anything meta than you. Uh, a meta game, according to which one or the other approach to statutory interpretation is correct. But the meta game is nowhere set down. It is a product of legal and political reflection. And in respect to that, the judge, judge is a rule maker, player, and rule applier. Nobody, uh, nonetheless, both Breyer and Scalia believe that they are judging a meta game. They speak with great certitude, like an umpire calling a bean ball, when they call, say, a committee report a ball or a strike. And so Robert's metaphor shows itself to be richly suggestive. Scalia and Breyer both believe they are servants of truth, not of their tastes or preferences, in admitting or denying the relevance of a committee report. And if Scalia were to admit, per impossibile, that the, uh, uh, that the committee report was relevant, he might very well come to the same conclusion as Breyer. While if Breyer were to adopt Scalia's method, his conclusion in a particular case might be the same as Scalia's. So, player, umpire, or rule maker? Do not misunderstand me. I do not scorn Chief Justice Roberts' metaphor. Rather, I honor it. The player umpire antithesis is more subtle than the rule maker rule applier antithesis. After all, whoever devises the rule for Major League Baseball or Softball or Little League is not on the field, but the players and umpire are. The players are competitors and the fans are ardent supporters of one side or the other, which is why it was important that nominee Roberts assure the committee, I will decide every case based on the record according to the law. And this then 
ties into the winsome statement, nobody ever went to a ball game to see the umpire. But the judges, as umpires, do have their fans. Uh, at New York University Law School, there is a Brennan Center for Justice. At the University of Arizona Law School, there is a Rehnquist Center. During graduation season, Supreme Court justices garner honorary degrees by the bushel. But there is no Hall of Fame for umpires. And as for coming to see the umpire, I ask, why is it that we parse these particular umpire's words with almost obsessional concentration? And who, if not the umpires, do crowds regularly line up on Maryland Avenue to see? The advocates, perhaps the players, but surely also, also those nine black-robed umpires. Yet Robert, Roberts makes a point that must be excavated more deeply. There is something special about the office of judge, and it antedates our Constitution by far. In previous work, I have several times cited the words of the Islamic jurist Ahmed ibn Hanbal, who died in Baghdad in 855. The just judge will be brought on the judgment day and confronted with such a harsh accounting that he will wish that he had never judged between any two, even as to a single date. Judges are three, two in fire and one in paradise. A man who has knowledge and judges by what he knows, he is in paradise. A man who is ignorant and judges according to his ignorance, he is in the fire. A man who has knowledge and judges by something other than his knowledge, he is in the fire. When Roberts told the committee that judges are not politicians, that he has no agenda, and that he will decide each case on the arguments, the record, and the rule of law, he was really promising, in the words of Ibn Hanbal, to judge according to his knowledge. Knowledge of what? The law. But surely Roberts and Ibn Hanbal must decide what makes up the law, where to find it and how to apply it. Consider again the views of Justices Scalia and Breyer about statutory interpretation. It is inevitable that a judge have some such idea about the subject. But that does not make the judge a politician, nor enlist him in an agenda. There is now a fashion for diligent research, some of which you will, be, uh, you will encounter later in this symposium, into the behavior of courts and judges. A recent example was reported by Adam Liptak in the New York Times. The study on which he reports concluded that the Roberts Court is measurably more business friendly than past courts, and that this is shown by, among other things, the proportion of times that the court agrees with the position taken by the United States Chamber of Commerce as amicus curiae. Such studies ignore qualitative distinctions. How important was the case? How far-reaching a precedent would it establish? How broadly was it decided? And it ignores entirely the reasons for the decision. This kind of research does treat judges as though they were politicians pursuing an agenda, if only unconsciously. For instance, the Citizens United case was of major importance to business. But it matters a great deal whether the case was decided in order to amplify the voice of businesses, or as I believe, as a further extension of its authors, Justice Kennedy's, consistent position that government has a very limited role in silencing speech on any subject, no matter who the speaker. This supposed pro-business trend is also said to be exemplified, uh, I'm going to skip through this, uh, all of which, all cases in which the chamber was no doubt the winner. But such research does not take into account that many of these results are controlled by acts of Congress, whose very intention was to procure such pro-business results. Surely it is not politics not to search for arguments to circumvent the will of Congress. 
the examples that I had in mind were the Federal Arbitration Act and the various acts uh, to keep uh, to keep class actions out of state courts and put them into federal courts. Very pro-business, but that was the statute, not the court. And yet the balls and strikes metaphor does seem to slight an important truth. It fails to explain why we remember the names of judges, but not umpires. The difference is not only that umpires referee games and judges umpire actual, not contrived conflicts, and that judicially umpired conflicts often have great significance for the participants. This is certainly a crucial difference but not necessarily an illuminating one. After all, it is the function of a metaphor to display on a different scale the puzzles we are trying to solve. I shall look elsewhere. One reason we do not remember umpires, but do remember judges, at least the judges of our high court, is that the justices write opinions to explain, to announce, indeed to constitute their rulings, but umpires do not. One reason I think I am onto something, something not everything, is that the judges of certain European courts are a bit more like umpires in that their rulings are often hardly explanations at all. They offer a list of considerations, an invocation of authorities, an announcement of the conclusion. Although the names of the participating judges may be given, the author is not specified, perhaps because he or she may only be a bureaucrat attached to the court whose duty it is to formulate the announcement. And certainly there are no concurring or dissenting opinions. There are, in a full sense, no opinions at all. From the beginning of our Supreme Court and well before that, in the tradition on which it draws, judgments have been embodied in an opinion. Each opinion carries the reasons for its conclusion. Each opinion is the operative act of the court. And this takes me to what I believe is at least one reason we have confirmation hearings, why we remember the names of our justices, and we, why we pay such attention to them inviting them to conferences, honoring them at dinners, and hanging on their most trivial utterances. <laughs> Judges in our system may not have an agenda and may not be politicians, although that is not always so. At, at least Chief Justice Roberts proclaims an ideal. But what Roberts does not deny to judges or to himself is a character, a personality, and a style. If an um umpire had any of these, it would be a distraction, an anomaly, as if he had a nose ring or a neck tattoo, though it need not interfere with his judge, uh, um umpiring if he had either one of these. But our great judges all had just that, a style, a personality, a character. <laughs> Remember the time, maybe you don't remember, when Chief Justice Rehnquist appeared one October uh, with gold stripes on his robe. Uh, well, style. This is quite different from their having an agenda or being politicians. And yet such traits are, traits are not just ornaments or distractions like my umpire's nose ring. Unlike the umpire's nose ring, these traits are part of who justices are and what they do as judges. So, to, so today, I would like to think further about the style and character of judges and how this intersects with the work they do, the product they deliver. And you will see, I hope, how inadequate are the political science accounts of judging, how those accounts are to the essence of judging, as would an account of the frequency of particular major and minor keys be to the essence of music. And to do that, I have chosen one particular judge, Robert Jackson, for several reasons. My colleague Noah Feldman's splendid new book, Scorpions, about the four dominant Roosevelt judges, 
re reawakened in me my fascination with the man. He made some of the best and boldest decisions in the whole of our constitutional jurisprudence. My particular favorite is West Virginia Board of Education against Barnett, the flag salute case, as well as some of the more perplexing and opaque ones. He stands with Marshall and Holmes as one of the great writers on the high court. And the justice for whom I clerk and whose memory I revere, John Marshall Harlan, filled not only his seat, but in some sense his role. Harlan was succeeded by William Rehnquist, who had clerked for Jackson, and for whom John Roberts, he of the balls and strikes, clerked and whose chair as chief justice he now fills. All four men in this apostolic succession indeed shared some, far from all, characteristics, a magisterial style, a certain aloofness, a disdain for sentimentality, and passages of passion and rhetorical bravura. It is the interpretation of style, and it was a great style, with substance in Jackson's work it, I'm sorry, it is the interpenetration of style with substance in Jackson's work as a justice on which I want to reflect. If this were a lecture on a great composer, then I would go to the piano from time to time to illustrate my point or offer more matter for the exposition. In exactly that way, I will give you passages from Jackson's oeuvre. And just as happens in such talks on music, Sometimes one wishes the lecturer would just shut up and keep playing. I will start with some passages he wrote, and there's no doubt he wrote them, that are not judicial opinions at all. They are drawn from his opening statement as chief United States prosecutor at the Nuremberg trial. This is how he begins. The privilege of opening the first trial in history for crimes against the peace of the world imposes a grave responsibility. The wrongs which we seek to condemn and punish have been so calculated, so malignant, and so devastating that no civilization can tolerate their being ignored because it cannot survive their being repeated that four great nations, flushed with victory and stung with injury, stay the hand of vengeance and voluntarily submit their captive enemies to the judgment of the law is one of the most significant tributes that power has ever paid to reason. Here we find some of Jackson's characteristic rhetorical tropes. For example, his use of balanced antitheses, or of a series of terms of increasing intensity, calculated, malignant, devastating, wrongs so malignant that science can, that civilization cannot tolerate their being ignored because it cannot survive their being repeated. It is decidedly Lincoln-esque and has become a cliche in political speechifying, ask not what your country and so on, but to what magnificent effect it is used by both Jackson and Lincoln. Recall Lincoln's second inaugural. Uh, Yet if God wills that it continues, the Civil War, until every drop of blood drawn with a lash shall be paid by another drawn with a sword, so still it must be said that the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Both Jackson and Lincoln invoked not only principle, but also morality and a common sense of decency. And the concluding, concluding phrase of Jackson's first paragraph, one of the most significant tributes that power has ever paid to reason, surely captures the highest aspiration of law better than any before or since, including balls and strikes. 
Uh, what kind of man is capable of such words? And being capable of them, what kind of judgment can we expect of him? He was obviously an ambitious man who had, by dint of hard work, talent, and shrewdness, worked himself up from being a small town Western New York lawyer with no legal education uh, to a situation of prominence in New York politics and then as a point man for Roosevelt in the legal pursuit of Andrew Mellon and the defense of the court packing plan. He had allowed himself to be seduced into staying in the Department of Justice by Roosevelt who dangled before him support of Jackson's candidacy for the governorship of New York and the prospect of a run of the, uh, to the, for the presidency in 1940. His maneuvering and disappointment about the chief justiceship in 1945 are well known. He was passionate, irascible, and vain. Surely the only justice to ever be named best dressed man in America by the Custom Tailors Guild. It might be said that the elegance of his language was in keeping with Jack Jackson's sense of style generally, but that would slight the passion and intelligence that his style clothed. So I shall turn to the connection between style, passion, and conviction. First, the style. Like the passion and the intelligence that I, celebra that I celebrate are clearly Jackson's own, a point that it is embarrassing even to have to mention, rather like saying of a bishop that so far as is known, he never once stole from the collection plate. But these degraded times require it. Here is an early example from a speech just, uh, Jackson as Attorney General gave to an assembly of Justice Department lawyers. If the prosecutor is obliged to choose his cases, it follows that he can choose his defendants. Therein is the most dangerous power of the prosecutor, that he will pick people that he thinks he should get rather than pick cases that need to be prosecuted. With the law books filled with a great assortment of crimes, a prosecutor stands a fair chance of finding at least a technical violation of some act on the part of almost anyone. In such a case, it is not a question of discovering the commission of a crime and then looking for the man who has committed it. It is a question of picking the man and then searching the law books or putting investigators to work to pin some offense on him. Notice the antithesis which illuminates the point. Here is the same rhetorical sense we heard in the Nuremberg opening statement, an accumulation of instances culminating in a phrase so memorable, original, and apt that it sounds like a cliche, but only because frequent quotation and repeated plagiarism soon would make it one. In the Nuremberg opener, it is the description of authority submitting itself to law as the tribute that power pays to reason. In the Justice Department address, it is not a question of discovering the crime and then looking for the man who has committed it. It is, a it is a matter of picking the man and then searching to pin some offense on him. A perfect description, it must be said, of how matters proceeded under the various avatars of the disgraced and disgraceful independent counsel laws. But Jackson's remarkable qualities as a judge were not simply limited to his talent for aphorism. Each aphorism clothed a deep and original thought that arose in equal part from passion and intelligence. Jackson had been, of course, an early partisan and a solicitor general advocate for Roosevelt's New Deal. He championed the disestablishment of pre-1936 Supreme Court precedents narrowly defining the range of federal legislative competence under the Commerce Clause and confining the competence of all government power, federal or state, by the eponymous Lochner Doctrine in its various manifestations. 
So it is he who in Wickard and Filburn, of which, by the way, we'll hear a great deal more in terms of the health care mandate, wrote, homegrown wheat overhangs the market. It supplies the need of the man who grew it, which would otherwise be reflected by purchases in the open market. The stimulation of commerce is a use of the regulatory function quite as definitely as prohibition or restriction. Wickard does not manifest the passion and poetry of the conclusion of West Virginia Board of Education v. Barnett. Struggles to coerce uniformity of sentiment in support of some end throughout thought essential to their time and country to have been waged by many good and as well as evil men. Those who begin coercive elimination of dissent soon find themselves exterminating dissenters. If there is any fixed star in our constitutional constell constellation, it is that no official high or petty can prescribe what shall be orthodox in politics, nationalism, religion, or other matters of opinion to force citizens to confess by word or act their faith therein. If there are any circumstances which permit an exception, they do not occur to us now. The almost offhand last clause, they do not occur to us now, serves only to personalize and intensify the soaring rhetoric of what went before. This is perfect pitch. But Wickard has a poetry of its own. It is, as it were, the poetry of reason, an inexorable procession from premise to, corol to corollary to conclusion. In music, one sees this too. Uh, there are few in the Golden, uh, Goldberg variations, few melodies, no heart-wrenching passages as in Bach's can cantata Ich habe genug, yet the variations elicit the thrill of perfected intelligence. There are other examples. What could be more prosaic than the question whether, here bear with me, whether the rights of the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation to enforce a note given as an accommodation to a failed bank are governed by state law or by some federal common law. In Dench Dumi against FDIC, Justice Douglas, writing for the court in his usual offhand manner, resolves this question by the easy route of construing the enabling statute as providing the gover governing rule, since if it did, there could be no question but that such a rule would prevail. Justice Frankfurter, at enormous length, uh, finesses the question by finding that both state and federal law had supplied the same conclusion. Justice Jackson writes that this intricate and perplexed question, which any of you who study federal courts must uh, know, requires, quotes, that we should attempt a more explicit answer. And after several, not too many, I should add, pages of close reasoning, he provides a charter ever more for something called the federal common law. Here's what he said. Were we bereft of the common law, our federal system would be impotent. This follows from the recognized futility of attempting all complete statutory codes and is apparent from the terms of the Constitution itself. Another example is Justice Jackson's definitive and magisterial opinion uh, in another rather technical case, Mullane against Central Hanover Bank and Trust Company, something which everybody has studied in civil procedure, which dealt with the thrilling question of what kind of notice the trustee of a common trust fund must give to the individual beneficiaries when it seeks to settle its account. Specifically, was a general notice printed in legal newspapers sufficient as to beneficiaries whose residence was known to the trustee. After carefully parsing the circumstances and precedents, Jackson concludes, when notice is a person's due, process 
which is a mere gesture, is not due process. I call attention to two aspects of this marvelous sentence. First, the words mere gesture that make palpable, indeed visible, of what is not enough. And then the elegant chiasmus, a person's due and is not due process. The discovery of a path through the perplexed and labyrinthine ways of the law and the display of what reason discovers there in a brief and lapidary phrase is the distinguishing characteristic of Jackson's work. Already by 1953, it had become clear, more federal court stuff, that the habeas jurisdiction of the federal courts implicated some authority, even necessity, to review criminal convictions procured in state courts. But habeas was, and still is, incidentally, a vexed issue. How can it be that in a rational system, a conviction fully litigated through the state courts with certiorari denied in the Supreme Court may then be re-examined and perhaps overturned by a single federal judge. Jackson, concurring in Brown v. Allen, noted this anomaly and proposed a way out that would limit habeas corpus in a severe but rational way. It is a road not taken, and perhaps it was too limited but Jackson deplored the arrogance implicit in giving such power to a single federal judge or to the federal courts in general. Conflicts with state court is in the inevitable result of giving the convict a virtual new trial before a federal court sitting without a jury. Whenever decisions of one court are reviewed by another, a percentage of them are reversed. However, reversal by a higher court is not proof that justice is thereby better done. There is no doubt that if there were a super Supreme Court, a substantial proportion of our reversals of state courts would also be reversed. We are not final because we are infallible, but we are infallible only because we are final. So in that case, the aphorism lasted longer than the conclusion. Jackson's determination to unravel and lay bare legal puzzles is evident in cases large and small. In Railway Express Agency against New York, for example, the court considered a constitutional challenge to a New York City regulation, another great case, forbidding advertising on the sides of trucks unless the advertisement was for the business in which the truck was engaged. This meant that the trucks that careened about the city delivering newspapers to newsstands could also advertise the daily headlines. But Railway Express could not rent out its truck's flanks to advertise the business of others. Railway Express thought this was an unfair and irrational distinction depriving them of their constitutional right to the equal protection of the law. Justice Douglas made short work of that claim, treating it to the same cursory denial accorded since the demise of Lochner to all claims by businesses that economic regulations deprive them of due process of law. Justice Jackson, Jackson who had been at the forefront, forefront of that rejection, in defending the New Deal was not so sure. There are two clauses of the 14th Amendment which this court may seek to invoke to, to invalidate ordinances by which municipal governments seek to resolve their local problems. One says that no, shall, no state shall deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. The other declares that no state shall de deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. My philosophy as to the relative readiness with which we should resort to these two clauses is almost diametrically opposed 
to the philosophy which prevails on this court. While claims of equal protection are frequently asserted, they are rarely sustained. Uh, but the court frequently uses a due process clause to strike down measures taken by municipalities to deal with activities in their streets and public places. Uh, invalidation of a statute or an ordinance on due process grounds leaves ungoverned and ungovernable, typical Jacksonian language, ungoverned and ungovernable conduct which many people find objectionable. Con invocation of the Equal Protection Clause, on the other hand, does not disable any government from dealing with the subject at hand. It merely means that the prohibition or regulation must have a broader impact. I regard it as a salutary doctrine the city, states, and federal government must exercise their power so as not to discriminate between their inhabitants except upon some reasonable differentiation fairly related to the object of regulation. This equality is not merely abstract justice. The framers of the Constitution knew, and we should not forget today, Jacksonian again, that there is no more effective practical guarantee, pay attention to this, against arbitrary and unreasonable government than to require that the principles of law which officials would impose upon a minority must be imposed generally. Here was reasoning as subtle and succinct as Chief Justice Marshall's anticipation of it in McCulloch against Maryland. And yet, interestingly enough, Jackson found the regulation valid. Jackson's personal need to go beyond a simple and jejune statement that would decide a case so that he might solve a, pro a puzzle the case represented and present that solution in concise, compelling, and lapidary terms is most famously illustrated by his concurrence in the Youngstown sheet and tube case, uh, the steel seizure case. Youngstown did present a challenge. The nation faced a threat to steel production. In wartime and precedents of presidential action were cited that Jackson had personally endorsed as attorney general. He starts with a winning touch of self-deprecation, proceeds to a phrase that demolishes for all time the pretension that the intention of the framers can offer a solution, and finally comes to his tripartite scheme that has, because of its simplicity, originality, and once stated self-evidence, has become canonical. Uh, here, Justice Jackson addresses the originalists, and may these words be inscribed in their flesh as by Kafka's machine in Devil, on, De on Devil's Island. Just what our forefathers did envision or would have envisioned had they foreseen modern con conditions must be divined from material almost as enigmatic as the dreams Joseph was called upon to interpret for Pharaoh. What is most striking is the cadence of the passage. There is standard legal terminology at the beginning of the sentence, although even this is put in the least hackneyed and bureaucratic form. He speaks not of officers or officials, but of executive advisors, not of a court, but of a judge. That is more personal, less official. His first sentence states a puzzle. The second begins with the word of interrogation, just what, and leads to the startling biblical illusion, ending with a wonderful sounding word, Pharaoh which Alexis Search has confirmed for me has never before or since appeared in the Supreme Court uh, reports. The effect is heightened by the touch, surely unplanned but instinctively knowing, of leaving the word Pharaoh standing alone, as in the King James Bible, unmodified by a definite article. 
This sense of cadence shows up in a different way in Justice rank Jackson's ranking of types of executive authority. When the president acts pursuant to an express or implied authorization of Congress, his authority as, is at its maximum, for it includes all that he possesses in his own right, plus all that Congress can delegate. When the president acts in absence of either congressional grant or denial of authority, there's a zone of twilight. When the president takes measures, pay attention George Bush, John Yu, incompatible with the expressed or implied will of Congress, his power is at its lowest ebb. For then he can rely only upon his own constitutional powers minus any constitutional powers of Congress over the matter. The first paragraph says flatly when presidential power is at a maximum. And those are the usual instances, in fact. Note the precision and focus of the two balanced terms. All that he possesses in his own right, plus all that Congress can delegate. Compare this to the last phrase of the last paragraph, where the same structure is reversed, and the word minus appears. The intermediate degree of power is a zone of twilight. Note that here, that is quite a familiar metaphor, and therefore risks de degenerating into a cliché. Jackson rescues it, however, by the high degree to which it is apt, and by syntactically reviving its literal meaning, he does not use the cliché, twilight zone, but speaks instead of a zone of twilight. The third state is where the president's power is at its lowest ebb. And again, this teeters on the edge of cliché, but is saved because its presence uh, to the third term in a cadence, maximum, twilight, lowest ebb, brings to mind the literal image of a seashore where the tide has receded and left exposed the widest expanse of beach. Finally, there is what I call the music of reason, where a logical point is put with such magical conciseness that it attains elegance in that way alone. This happens in the phrase in which Jackson dismisses Chief Justice Vinson's contention in dissent that the president, even in the absence of legislative authority, has an inherent power to take action in a national emergency. Such power, Justice Jackson replied, either has no beginning or it has no end. I cannot leave this marvelous opinion without recalling one other such touch, in which Jackson refutes the claim that the Article II Commander-in-Chief designation, pay attention, Dick Cheney, uh, supplies the authority required in the third category. There are indications that the Constitution did not contemplate that the title Commander-in-Chief of the Army and Navy will constitute him also Commander-in-Chief of the country its industries, and its inhabitants. I come now to two opinions that have confounded and disappointed Jackson's admirers, Korematsu and Dennis. Jackson's opinion in these cases and in Youngstown display his awareness of the extreme pressures that powerful external military threats place on fundamental, on fidelity to fundamental principles of liberty and decency. It has been said that the Jackson who wrote the flag salute decision is not the same man who wrote the concurrence in Dennis, and that his 1945 experience of ch as chief prosecutor at Nuremberg spooked him out so that he abandoned the character in the latter that he had displayed in the former. This is wrong. The steel seizure case in, in that case, Jackson denied the commander-in-chief an authority that Truman claimed he needed to prosecute a war. National morale and national security could not have been more salient considerations than they were during World War II, 
and yet Jackson cast the balance in favor of individual liberty in the flag salute and Korematsu cases. No, one must look at what Jackson actually said in Korematsu and Dennis and ask whether what he said might after all not have been right and, what, and whether that was why he said it. And when one look, does look, one sees that neither Korematsu is so harsh in its judgment of power in its pursuit of national security, nor Dennis so indulgent towards it. My colleague Noah Feldman, parsing of Jackson's opinion in Korematsu, cannot be improved upon, so I adopt it. Justice Black for the court had approved the exclusion and internment of West Coast Japanese Americans on the lame explanation that the military order was based on loyalty, not race, against which he inveighed in terms by now canonical. Jackson's opinion display, displays first his rejection of this bogus reasoning. A citizen's presence in the locality, however, was made a crime only if his parents were of Japanese birth. Had Korematsu who had been one of the four others, say a German alien, an Italian alien, and a citizen of American-born ancestors, convicted of treason but out on parole, only Korematsu's presence would have violated the order. The difference between their innocence and his crime would result not from anything he did, said or thought, different than they, but only in that he was born of different racial stock. So there you are. But here's what he goes on to say. It would be impractical and dangerous idealism to expect or insist that in each specific military command in an area of probable operations will conform to conventional tests of constitutionality. When an area is so beset that it, that it must be put under military control at all, the paramount consideration is that its measures be successful rather than legal. And then he goes on to say, a military commander may overstep the bounds of constitutionality. And it is an incident. If we review and approve that passing incident becomes the doctrine of the Constitution. The principle then lies about like a loaded weapon ready for the hand of any authority that bring, can bring forward a plausible claim of an urgent need. And yet, Jackson wrote, I do not suggest that the court should have attempted to interfere with the army in carrying out its task. It is worth recalling that Lincoln refused to comply with Chief Justice Taney's order releasing Merriman from unconstitutional custody and that Lincoln's soldiers even blocked entry to the base where Merriman was confined to the marshal who, ser who sought to serve Taney's order on its commandant. One might use Jackson's words to say this was an incident not a precedent. Well, I'm going to leave off uh, Jackson's discussion of Dennis, which though I think is quite marvelous, uh, he did not reach the same conclusion. Uh, but let's go back to balls and strikes. The style, the character, the personality of the umpire matter. The, they matter to the judging and so they matter to the law and to the outcomes that affect people who are judged and who are governed by the law. I am not talking about the biography of the umpire, that Robert Jackson was ambitious, that he was irascible, that he was vain, that his judgment failed him disastrously in his feud with Hugo Black, that he died in the arms of his mistress. I am not talking about these. I'm not talking about them because we cannot be sure of them. In, 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 in any event, their relevance is more the stuff of biographers and novelists. Biographies of judges are often dull and disappointing, even though the work of the judge 
may be thrilling. Rather, I have tried to display for you the distinctive style and character of one justice's writings, as it is in that writing that his thinking and therefore his judging, judging are embodied. When a judge does his own work and the writing is as pungent as was Jackson's, then the style is not just a veneer brushed onto an otherwise finished product, I just saved that from being a cliche, it is the product itself. Think of another domain, Newton's laws of motion, or Watson and Crick's 900 word article announcing their discernment of the structure of the DNA molecule. The discoveries are momentous. They are taught to students everywhere and are employed in a myriad of uses and devices. But the actual words in which Newton, or Watson and Crick announced them are of only antiquarian interest. They are not the thing itself. But Jackson's decisions in the flag salute and steel seizure case, even if bolderized in textbook epitomes, are deprived of their power if they are so bolderized and therefore of their practical effect. It would be almost as bad if we, as if we sought to give in a phrase the meaning of a Shakespeare sonnet or explain the elegance of a Bach partita. And so it is not the character and personality of the man I, I celebrate, but the character and personality of his work. In this, a judge is more like a great athlete who we come to watch not only for the runs he scores, but for the style and grace with which he accomplishes them and which are inextricably bound up with his ability to score them. Chief Justice Roberts was right. Nobody comes to watch the umpire. In the case of a great judge, one cannot tell the dancer from the dance. Thank you. Um, we're going to do about 10, maybe 15 minutes of questions for Professor Freed, so feel free to uh, come to the microphones. Where? Good. Um, hi there. I recently learned about Youngstown in my constitutional class and how Jackson's opinion, although he was just a concurrence, became adopted as a law today, his three categories. Do you think it's more because Rehnquist clerked under him, or is it because of, really because of Jackson's eloquence and how his uh, three categories made Oh, the made eloquence. Sense? Uh, the, it was, first of all, Youngstown, the Youngstown concurrence was striking when announced and has been, if you look in your case book, you will find that Black and Frankfurter are excerpted in paragraphs, and the Jackson opinion is given almost in its entirety. And that's been so for a long time. Uh, Rehnquist was not, interestingly enough, particularly uh, taken with Jackson. Uh, he didn't, uh, I, I don't think they were, uh, they, they were uh, so I don't think it, uh, and, and I don't know of any particular case in which Rehnquist picked up on the Youngstown language. I don't think that's it. I don't think that's it. Although Rehnquist had a terrific style all of his own, and he too liked to be briefer and more decisive uh, than these very, very long opinions 
that had become standard in the Supreme Court, in part because they weren't written by the justices, they were written by the law clerks. Rehnquist did his own work. That helps. Uh, as I'm sure you know, and as you hinted at uh, in your remarks, there's a whole body of legal scholarship on, and political science scholarship on uh, examining the party of the appointing president for judges, et cetera, and how that relates to their decision. -making. Yes, I despise it. Uh, that, and that, that's my question. You, you hinted at that it's, uh, I think you said, deficient. Is it totally deficient? Is it worthless? Or does it give us rough, rough approximations and data points about how judges make their decisions? No. It doesn't give a rough approximation. Uh, and it leaves out of account, as I said, what's most important, which is why they decided that way. And one example, I shared this with uh, my very good friend, Judge Posner, uh, who's one of the authors of that study, I should say. And another will be addressing you later, Lee Epstein. Uh, uh, I said to him, but Dick, a lot of these decisions are probably decisions uh, following acts of Congress. And you say, or the study suggests, that the court has become more business friendly in the last whatever it is years. But the fact is Congress had become more business friendly and had passed more business friendly statute. So the only thing that would be left would be for the court willfully to say, well, you know, Congress has been doing that, but we are going to get around it. Uh, that is a kind of technique worthy of Justice Stevens, who was a brilliant man. Uh, but uh, uh, he was quite predictable, and, co and what Congress had or had not said has only an orthogonal connection to what he decides. As a fan of uh, Justice Jackson, as we, we discussed last night, I was interested in uh, whether you might have thoughts about the, the relationship of the Korematsu decision to the preceding year's Hirabayashi decision. And it seems to me it, it's an interesting, it may, it may shed light on the, the, your reading of Korematsu, but it may also shed light on the broader theme of judging and politics in the sense of the ways in which the Korematsu opinion Jackson presents as a rejoinder to that. Uh, no, I don't think I'm going to get into it. It's too intricate to sort of uh, to serve up uh, extemporaneously. Oh, come on. Well, uh, all I can say is read. That's the great, the great lesson is, and for heaven's sakes, don't just read law. Where did these men get this style? Uh, I think both Lincoln and Jackson got it from the same places, the King James Bible and Shakespeare. That's where you learn it. Uh, those, are, uh, those should be your reading, uh, your spare time reading. Uh, 